Welcome to the Queer Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Venagoni. Here we have conversations with artists, healers, and activists who enliven the LGBTQ communities and who empower our queer spirits to flourish. My guest today is Dr. Kirk Prine. Kirk is a body story life coach, integrative body worker, Reiki master, primary facilitator of Flesh and Spirit Community, and co-founder of the Missing Thread Mystery School for Entrepreneurs. He is also the author of Erotic Body Prayer. Today we talk about how his experiences of abuse led him on his path from survivor to thriver, and how that path led him to be the teacher and healer he is today. Find more about Kirk at fleshandspirit.org and themissingthread.com. Welcome, Kirk. Thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So I wonder if we could start by having you share with us a little bit more about what a body story expert is and what it is that you do as a body story expert. (laughs) Okay. So yeah, body stories are actually a term that I created in the 80s to talk about how the accumulation of our experiences gets stored not just in our brains, but in the the cellular and the energetic mass of our body. So we create stories like agreements, and usually those are unconscious agreements with ourselves about a situation, especially things that, you know, are threatening or uncomfortable or somehow have peak moments to them. So at any rate, body story work is simply helping people clear that, unpack that so that they can actually be what we call it more fully in their purpose, more healing can happen, they can be more available to intimacy, to whatever their heart's desires are, those kinds of things. So it's pretty in-depth work. It's very exciting, but it's all about engaging the body in the process of our healing and is open to all modalities to weave into it. So it's not about a technique as much as it is about weaving together how and what is the body saying so that you can work with that and change the story so you can have better results. Mm-hmm. And I wonder so I'm a you... life coach. So yeah. basically a body story expert is, is someone who is a life coach that actually listens to the body uh, as part of the process and engages the body in the healing process and offers somebody not only clearing out, but a new experience so that they can really strengthen what it is they want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wonder if you can give some examples of some body stories that you sure. worked with and shifted. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And especially in a, your audience, talking to a queer man some years ago, and you know, he was very successful in his life, and everything was working with exception to the fact that he didn't have any real intimacy and was looking for a partner, a life partner. And he came to me. And while we were working, he actually met somebody who lived in another city. So he set up a flight to go see this man. And as soon as he did that, he got shingles. And if you've ever had shingles or anybody on the call ever had shingles, it's quite painful. And the last thing you want is to be touched. But actually what he wanted more than anything was to be touched was to be touched deeply and to make that intimate connection with someone. So it's very curious as I'm working with him, he's coming in presenting, I want more intimacy in my life, meets somebody that he thinks he's going to go date and then has shingles. Well, so we worked on that and went, hmm, you know, what's your body saying? Well, this happened three times to make the story um, a bit shorter, but he tried this three times. And after the third time, he actually had a dream. And what came up for him in his dream was a remembering a time when he was a little boy. And it was Christmas and he wanted a bicycle. He knew what brand, he knew what color, you know, what model, you know, the whole thing and told his parents for Christmas, I want this. And so Christmas came and his parents gave him a red wagon. So sounds like a pretty benign story, but his body story was that he had to be independent. If he wanted to get something, he had to get it himself. 
and that he couldn't ask for help and that, you know, he just really shielded himself from being vulnerable to open up to what his desires were. So here he is really wanting intimacy and all of those things were part of the stories that he was holding in his body. When he really let go of that and, and gave that back to really his parents who he needed to be angry with and let that go, he really opened up to the possibility of intimacy and actually met someone and, you know, partnered. It wasn't even the man that he was going to go see, but it was interesting to watch how the shingles was just a way of his body kind of erupting and saying, no way are we going to let you get touched. And the very thing he wanted was to be touched. So really powerful moment and breakthrough, shifting a body story into uh, his heart's desire. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I heard you say is that as a body story expert, you really listen to the stories of the body. Yes. And I know that you've talked about being a sexual abuse survivor and thriver. Yes. And how that yeah. experience allowed you to develop the gifts of listening and seeing beyond what is apparent. And I wonder if you can talk more about that path and that experience of developing those gifts, sure. that trauma. Sure, sure, yeah. A bunch of things kind of wove together in my early childhood. And one was, you know, that my father sexually abused me as a young boy for a brief period of time. But one of my kind of strategies of taking care of myself as a result of that was that I would go hide in closets. What a great metaphor, huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, I would literally go hide in closets and I would listen. And so what I developed, and I believe everybody can develop this, it just happened that this was the gift out of, out of the experience was I learned to listen to not only sound, but kind of energetically. So I didn't feel safe in the world. So I listened for having safety. And, and because of that, my abilities to listen kind of beyond words and sound and to the energetics of a body is more heightened than most people because of this experience. And of course, you know, part of my healing then came as, as I recognized, you know, all of this is, is in my body and how it was shutting me off to having deeper levels of intimacy of actually having physical manifestations in, in my body from the abuse. And when I started working with that, and I can tell you, you know, multiple stories if you'd like, but how each one of those shifted to some degree and in some cases actually healed you know, my symptoms completely. So it's been a really powerful journey, but it took the wound. It's that idea of a wounded healer or what I call a peaceful warrior to really face my fears and be willing to know myself so that I could turn that story around, turn the energetics of it and find the gifts that had come out of the abuse that have allowed me to be a healer for others, especially those who have experienced any kind of trauma or abuse themselves and have those stories in their bodies. Mm -hmm. As a therapist myself who often works with people with trauma and I work a little somatically, not as much as mm -hmm. you do, but I know yeah. that people oftentimes have a hard time feeling into their body, let alone listening to their body. And I wonder if you could share with our listeners, like what are the ways that might show up of them being able, beginning to start to listen to their own body? Hmm. So how might they listen to their body more fully? Yeah, Is yeah. What you're asking, yeah, yeah. Or to be even yeah. begin to practice that. Yeah, well, I think it's as simple as what you just put out there, though, which is, oh, you know, what am I feeling in my body? What are the sensations in my body? And, and checking in with that and just kind of making that part of your meditation or your homework assignment for yourself each day to do that. And of course, you know, you can use every method out the wazoo to do that, you know, whether it's just sitting and getting quiet or just kind of doing a body scan over yourself or and checking in for those feelings or breath work and you know, all of those things are helpful tools but I think just asking the question what is it that I'm feeling I'm feeling numb mm -hmm. ah you know okay so numbness is a good place to start 
you know, in the work that I do is with people, you know, I have people do some very simple things like check in with how they feel in their bodies and then stand across from somebody and have a lot of space in between them and start walking towards them. And notice if what they're feeling in their body changes as they get closer or as when they first touch maybe a hand over the heart or something, just to make that connection. Do they tighten up? Are they breathing differently? So really checking in with heart rate and breath to just, you know, what's going on? And that's the inquiry, I think, that is the peaceful warriors. You're just willing to know yourself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people aren't interested in that work right away until something really difficult comes into their path that, you know, kind of spurs them into that. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that you've also been practicing massage for many, many years. And I imagine Mm -hmm. that through that practice of encountering so many different kinds of bodies that really helped you learn to tune into other people bodies. Sure. And I wonder if you can share a little bit more about what you've learned about other people's bodies and the way that you relate to their bodies in this work and the coaching work. Sure. You know, I've been fortunate over my journey, not only to do my own healing work, but to be around a lot of different kinds of healers. And once I actually saw a Peruvian healer, shaman, And he couldn't even speak English, so he had to translate with someone. But what he would do is he would put gauze uh, pads under his hands and place them over the body. And his idea was that we could actually become at the same vibration as the person. And so he would do kind of what are called extractions. And, you know, whether it was kind of hocus pocus or not, it got the point across as he did one of those experiences with me that the gauze pad got all dark and gunky and when it was just a white gauze pad and it was like well how did that happen and so it taught me you know I don't do that kind of psychic surgery stuff that a shaman does but I understand the frequency of one's body and personal space that stores all of that material So I'll tell you a story to kind of line that up. You know, a man came to see me one day, gay man, and he was an extremely large, 300, 400 pounds man and got on my massage table and I started working with him. And immediately I could tell in touching his body that he was just clenching up. And then he was was actually getting more rigid instead of more relaxed. And I just paused and I said, you know, is something going on or what are you feeling? Can you tell me? And at that point, he just broke into tears and he yelled at, I hate my body. I hate my body. I hate my body. And, you know, I kind of teared up with him and just said, you know, can you allow me to continue just to touch you? And as I did that, he started to relax more and more and more. And at the end, I usually do what's called Reiki or some healing energy. And I'm doing some of that. And I noticed one of my ears just got all full and and painful. And I said, what's going on with you? And he said, well, you know, I've actually had an earache for like two weeks and no medication has done anything. And I said, oh, well, let's just kind of imagine that you're running some healing energy. I mean, you already kind of discharged some stuff earlier in the session. So just run some energy into your ear. And he went, oh my God, you know, the pain is gone. So it was one of those moments where I touched his whole body, but he had to discharge the painful emotional stuff that he was feeling so that he could actually receive. And so it's not so much about the practitioner. Certainly the practitioner needs to be coming in with intention and clarity to be there to serve and facilitate healing. But it's about what are the shields or the stories or what's being trapped in the muscle tissue and in the energy of each body that will allow it to release and receive what it needs so that more healing, more freedom, more of the desires of their heart can happen. And all of that can take place on a non-spoken level, but for me, really being able to name things helps you really own it 
So this man was able to name, I just got healed today, and I actually dropped some of my shame about my body. I saw him two weeks later in the Castro and ran into him. I said, oh, how are you doing? He said, oh, I'm so grateful. That was so wonderful. And, you know, my earache, it went away. It's just miraculous. So, you know, the results of touching somebody, nobody's going to be the same. Everybody's going to be different because everybody has different stories that we think of as stress and toxins and so forth on a biological level, but energetically are stored in the body that keep us from actually having really whatever it is our heart's desires are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So I know another big part of your work in your coaching and with Flesh and Spirit community is uh-huh. the blending of spirituality with the physical. Mm-hmm. And I know that you were also in the seminary for a while. And I wonder if you mm-hmm. could talk a little bit more about how you blend the experience of spirituality and what you mm-hmm. learned through your own spiritual practice into mm-hmm. the work mm-hmm. with the erotic and the physical. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Fasten your seatbelt for a few more stories. So uh, right after my abuse, I actually had some mystical experience within, you know, a conventional, traditional Christian ritual. But it was much bigger than what most people talk about in that ritual. And what I felt was this connection to everything. I mean, I felt one with the trees and I felt like I was so hungry for the divine. And I didn't have a language like everybody else had, but I just knew something had awakened inside of me. And then shortly after that experience, as a teenager, I, in trying to fumble my way through coming out, I had a sexual experience. And in that sexual experience with with a man who was older than myself, all of a sudden, I had the same feeling whoosh through my body that I had when I was, when I had that mystical experience. And I felt it with him as we're playing, being erotic, having sex and pleasure. And this goes through me. And he kind of paused for a second and he said, what did you do to me? And I said, I didn't know. I just knew I was having a great time. But I also knew that I felt this go through me. And, and he said, well, you know, I've had, you know, tendonitis in my arm forever and it's really painful. It's all gone. All the pain's gone. And I went, oh my God, wow, this is kind of cool. So I learned really early on about kind of one, having a mystical experience, but two, having a mystical experience through sex, Mm -hmm. that sex was healing. It had the potentials of actually doing something wonderful to change one's body chemistry and energetics that healing could take place. So I had that experience. And then I went to seminary and started learning everything else but that and learning how who I was not appropriate and was not okay and that I needed to heal that. Mm. So it put me on a big quest of really trying to resolve that tension of spirituality and sexuality for myself that took a number of years to journey through. But in the process of that, what I started remembering was those two experiences, that my body knew the truth that was going to set me free. And that no scripture, no dogma, no interpretation from any religion was going to actually invalidate my experience. My experience told me what the truth was. And that's what really body stories are. We think we know what the truth is and we've made an agreement with ourselves to shield ourselves. But when we really get free, we know the real truth. And so I kind of came back to that and started studying across all traditions about spirituality. And certainly I knew about energetics because as a kid, I, you know, learned how to listen. So kind of energy medicine, shamanism, Buddhism, you know, all of them gave me a different vantage point to even reinterpret what I was experiencing while in seminary and putting all of that together together to go, oh, wow, 
I get it. Everything is about energy. You know, the Hindus talk about our chakras, our energy centers. Well, you know, one energy center is not better than another. It is not higher and lower, as, as people always put it. You know, those energy centers are all one energy. So our sexual and creative energy is connected also to our heart energy. And to separate those is to do a disservice and a dishonor to the creation of who we are. You know, I love Audre Lorde, you know, his work about the erotic and the spiritual and the political, that they're really all one same energy, you know, that rising up inside of us, that awakening inside of us, that quest to really find the divine, that big sea connection with all that is, that may be through the earth and through nature, and maybe through some forms of service, you know, but whatever it is, that awakening is erotic energy. And when I started beginning to get it, oh, yeah, you know, I've really been gifted with understanding that the erotic and the spiritual are not separate, but they're one and the same. And the disservice and the lie has been to separate those two things, allowing people to set up systems to oppress ourselves and others around having spirituality and eroticism being two separate things. Mm -hmm. And I wonder in the work that you do with other queer mm -hmm. men, what you yeah. noticed might be one of the biggest challenges that you see queer men have with mm -hmm. reconciling the connection between their body and spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly there's a lot to unpack. So, you know, I mean, between our own kind of family dysfunctions, which most of us had, and, you know, our cultural and religious dysfunctions, depending on which flavor we were a part of, and even where we grew up in what part of the country or the world, you know, uh, the environments that told us the messages that we internalized about, you know, that we were wondrously made, and most of us heard anything but that. So I think if I could reduce it down to something pretty simple, I mean, you know, there's always our fear, there's always our, our grief, because we've all been hurt, and there's our shame, and there's our, there are feelings of not belonging, and needing to be right, and all those kinds of things that impact us all. But I think the bottom line is, we've really forgotten who we are as individuals and as a tribe. That queer people, for me, we didn't come to the planet to express ourselves in whatever gender configurations, whatever sexual orientation configurations. We didn't come to the planet to diminish those but to celebrate them and allow them to be a part of our service, to be a part of the gift of healing ourselves in the planet. And so denying ourselves of our queer identities, whatever that begins to look like, I don't think there's ever been a fully safe time for queer people to know themselves fully because we're always fighting something outside of ourselves and most importantly, something inside of ourselves that doesn't allow us to be fully who we are. Yeah. So I think that we've unlayered some of that in the past. And of course, you know, in the prior administration in our country, you know, things were really moving in a very progressive way and people were feeling, ah, I can be more at ease in my body and out and open and honest about who I am and celebrate that and tell others all of that was happening. And then the backlash of what we're in right now started happening. So I don't think there's ever been a perfect time yet where we have really remembered fully who we are. And I think that's the biggest key. Do you want to go on this spiritual journey of knowing who you are? Why did you come here as a queer man, a queer woman, a queer person, a transgender person, a person who doesn't think and fit into the boxes of what are the traditional conventions? Why? And therein, I think, is part of the purpose and part of the healing tapestry that is yet to be woven. Mm -hmm. Powerful stuff. Yeah, it's juicy. It's mm -hmm. juicy. Yeah. 
So in wrapping up, I wonder if you can share with us a person, yeah. practice, or experience that has supported your queer spirit to flourish. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, well, we could spend hours on that. Yeah, I'm so grateful to, I'm even grateful to the folks that were doing the best they could, but fed me some oppressive lies because a lot of those people really had my best interest in hand. And so as kind of the wounded healer idea, I don't even want to say that they may actually have been some of the greatest ingredients. It's kind of like throwing a piece of sand to into an oyster and coming up with a pearl you know they were throwing sand into my oyster and you know i came up with pearls from it but on the other side of that would be people like in fact i saw him just the other day i hadn't seen him for a while now but beloved don clark who wrote the book loving someone gay and when i came to san francisco and was starting the work of flesh and spirit community here i used to meet with him regularly and thought of him as as a mentor to me and he's now 87 years old going on 88 and you know his pioneering through times pre stonewall of being on the streets and demanding queer rights and gay rights at that point in time, but his pioneering as a psychologist to, to really bring into the clinical community who we are uh, as gay people and queer people was not a dysfunction, but actually part of the gift that I was talking about before. So, you know, he would be somebody that I deeply value as having influenced my path, supported my path, and just mirrored back what I knew already, but he helped it germinate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. And I know that you have an event coming up in September, Matters of the mm -hmm. Heart. I wonder if you want to share with us a little bit more about that and how people could get involved. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're interested in any of the work that for queer men that we're doing in Flesh and Spirit community in San Francisco, it, it, you just go to our website, you know, fleshandspirit.org. But Matters of Heart is simply, you know, we play with uh, six different archetypes a lot in, in our community. And one of them is the lover, which is all about intimacy again. And, you know, what gets in the way of our intimacy is oftentimes a lot of things, but in particular grief. So we're doing a two-day workshop of just clearing out some of the stuff that we don't need to carry so that we can actually really touch from a deeper place of connection and explore intimacy in a deeper way. So there will be a lot of exercises and touch work and intentional clearing out stuff that will be done in the workshop. But for anybody who feels like they want to expand their level of connection and intimacy, it would be a juicy workshop to uh, participate in. And is it just for queer men or is it for queer it, women? Or This particular one is just for queer men. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Kirk, for being here today. It was a pleasure speaking with you and hearing more of your stories, and I look forward to connecting more soon. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for your work. You're certainly bringing a lot of goodness to the world, which is much needed. So I appreciate you, Nick. Thank you. To find the resources we discussed today, find the show notes at thequeerspirit.com. And if you enjoyed the show, remember to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. This will help us reach and support more queer people all over. Thanks for listening and see you next time.